to understand the world a little better, I'm your host Timo Wunderlich and with me is Manfred B. Steger. He's a sociology professor at the University of Hawaii at Manua and author of several books including Neoliberalism, a very short introduction by the Oxford University Press. Now, I have to be honest, uh, Manfred, I had to Google neoliberalism first, and I'm still not quite sure if I understand what it is. What, what is neoliberalism? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me on your program. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, if we take the word neoliberalism apart, there are two parts to it, right? Two components. One is neo, which of course we all know means new. And the other one is liberalism, uh, which is uh, uh, an ideology, an ideology that goes back to uh, the 18th century, 17th century even, uh, which emphasizes the individual. It emphasizes individual rights. It emphasizes uh, the fact that we all are endowed with uh, certain rights that government can take away from us. And therefore government should be limited. And one of the rights that supposedly we have as John Locke, the, the British philosopher says, by nature is the right to have property. And this mm -hmm. is one of the really, really main points of liberalism is that the state government should not interfere with our rights to uh, dispose of property, to deal with property, to exchange property, to hold property. So we can see right away that neoliberalism is really emphasizing the individual's right to property. And it also emphasizes that the state should be limited. In other words, the state should really only interfere insofar as it enforces those rights. In other words, if there are criminals or if there are people who try to take away by force what is our right, then we need a state that makes sure that property rights and other kinds of rights uh, are being enforced. But that's the extent to which the state should really interfere, which means that uh, with uh, liber uh, liberalism, we get an idea of uh, homo economicus, in other words, uh, a human nature being one uh, that is very much uh, about uh, trading things, about making things, about owning things. And when we then say that this is an a, a ideology that goes back 200 years, 300 years, uh, what's new about it, right, because we're talking about neoliberalism, What's really new about it is that these ideas really got, came uh, out of fashion uh, about 100 years ago, uh, when uh, with the rise of industrial capitalism in the 19th century and then early 20th century, uh, it became clear that uh, government was necessary to make sure that the fruits of labor, if you want to put it this, this way, were being distributed more uh, uh, evenly that uh, there were problems, as Marx was writing about uh, class conflicts, uh, there were inequalities that arose. So what happened in the 20th century is the state became stronger, the state took a more active role in the economy, and ultimately, uh, after World War II, uh, for about 30 years, uh, we uh, experienced what was called then uh, regulated capitalism or controlled capitalism, insofar as the state really uh, uh, made sure that certain uh, distributive and, and uh, ownership uh, issues were part of state decisions, not just the individual. Uh, one very important British uh, economist by the name of John Maynard Keynes was responsible for the general uh, framework of uh, what then was called Keynesianism, what I just called controlled capitalism. Uh, but in the 1970s, for a variety of reasons which we can get into, that form of capitalism, that stage of capitalism uh, got into trouble. And one way out, so to speak, was to resurrect uh, li liberalism in a new form. And there you have it, neoliberalism, a new form of liberalism, uh, reinvented, resurrected. Some people say uh, zombies that returned uh, after a couple of hundred years. Uh, in the 1980s, we were, uh, I think most of your viewer, even though that's ancient history, are uh, familiar with uh, the names of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, uh, who were very much responsible for this introduction or resurgence of liberalism in a new form. So, so it made a comeback. Um, if liberalism is mainly about uh, the protection of property rights and 
the, the, the other rights are just they they're just has to be as free as possible so meaning anarchy or it goes in that into that direction well you know it's really interesting because what you're bringing up is another word uh, to really confuse our listeners right now. Let's just introduce another word here. Uh, uh, but I think they're all familiar with that, libertarianism, right? Mm -hmm. Libertarianism is really the idea that uh, individual decisions and individual rights should be almost absolute. In other words, that uh, unless I hurt you, I should be able to do whatever I want to do. There's a little joke about libertarianism, uh, which goes, uh, I can leave my axe everywhere I want except in your chest. <laughs> Meaning, of course, right, that I should be able, you can think immediately of gun ownership as an issue. I should be able to own guns. I should be able to do whatever I want to as long as I don't harm other people. That's where mm -hmm. the limit goes. Libertarians believe in that. So in a sense, neoliberalism was also connecting to some of these really, uh, as some people would think, very extreme forms of individualism insofar as they said, yeah, all rights are important to answer your question. So it's not just about property. It's also about my right to bear arms, for example, or buy arms. It's also about my right to have a divorce. It's also about my right to have an abortion. It's also about my right to not be uh, religious or belong to an organized religion. All of those rights are important. But neoliberals would say the most fundamental right is that of property. Because if I don't have property, if I don't have wealth, if I don't have the opportunity to be economically successful, all other rights in a way are connected to that and therefore uh, are secondary. So in a sense, they're making, and of course one can, one can argue over this, but they're making the right to property, sort of economic prosperity, the centerpiece of what it means to be happy or pursue happiness or have a certain sense of well-being as a human being. You could also call it human dignity. So when did you say this uh, new term of neoliberalism uh, came first about? Well, you know, it's really interesting because the original term was uh, ordo liberalism, or some people say ortho. Ortho means, uh, you know, like orthodox means right, right liberalism. You could translate it as that. And it came out of Germany in the 1920s uh, from the University of Pri uh, Freiburg. There were a number of uh, economists who, after World War I, wanted to uh, kind of uh, push for uh, the idea that the economy you can imagine after World War I, uh, especially in Germany, the economy was in real bad shape. And they thought what needed to happen in order to bring the German economy back and, and other economies was to sort of uh, turbocharge it by making sure that especially enterprises, large enterprises weren't taxed too much, uh, that they could uh, hire relatively cheaply uh, labor, uh, that they would be able to also be supported by the state, for example, in terms of certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, production sites of factories and other things. So, in other words, it was the idea that power should be as much as possible uh, returned to the economic sphere. And that was sort of like the roots of neoliberalism. And two very important people, uh, also economists, uh, uh, one uh, Austrian, the other one uh, American, uh, sort of were young people around that time. Uh, the, the Austrian was August Hayek and the American Milton Friedman. And they were young people. They sort of uh, encountered that. They read about it. And for the rest of their lives, they would pursue it. So by the 1970s, when they were not young anymore, uh, all of a sudden, because the economy was doing badly, because Keynesianism controlled capitalism, was experiencing problems, all of a sudden, you know, their ideas that previously sounded pretty far out and pretty extreme were taken as well, you know, let's try it. Let's see if, you know, a new way of organizing the economy could work. And uh, whether or not it worked, it depends on who you ask. That's why I think it's very, very important to see that neoliberalism is an ideology, right? A sort of shared ideas and values that are being held as true by certain groups in society. 
Uh, who would be examples of uh, neoliberalism, meaning countries now? Oh, the neoliberal countries. Well, you know, yes. a lot of people say that the United States is, and, and, and the UK are a perfect example of neoliberal countries. Uh, insofar as uh, neoliberalism sort of uh, came out of there in the 1970s. But there are also some Latin American countries uh, that very early on already, for example, Chile, uh, that sort of adopted these neoliberal principles. And I think we, at some point we should talk about what some of those neoliberal principles are. But uh, certainly, you know, the United States, certainly UK, certainly some Latin American countries, But neoliberalism, and this is what uh, my co-author, Ravi Roy, and I are arguing in our book, neoliberalism became global. It was really exported by certain institutions, uh, economic, international economic institutions that were created after World War II, like the International Monetary Fund, like the World Bank. It was uh, sort of exported to the rest of the world. So it became, you could argue, it was pushed uh, onto other countries who then adopted it as well. Why? They adopted it for two reasons. One is because their elites, in other words, their governing elites, people who were in the government of these countries, were educated uh, in uh, the West. So they were more or less confronted with these ideas. They accepted those ideas. They grew. They they went to universities, let's say in in Washington or in San Francisco or in London. And uh, Reagan and, and Thatcher uh, were big in the 1980s. So they sort of took those ideas and thought they were true believers, right? They thought it would really work. So they went back to their countries. And when they came to power, they sort of took them over. The second reason why it was adopted is because international economic institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank were saying to countries, especially in the global south, poor, country in the, poor countries in the global south, If you do not adopt this neoliberal program that we think you need, we won't give you any loans. Hmm. So in other words, in order to get necessarily necessary development loans that those country, country needed, uh, they had to adopt what was called the neoliberal Washington consensus. Now, why is it called Washington consensus? Because Uh, apparently, the idea was that this was the only way that everybody agreed to uh, the economy should be run. Like, like uh, Margaret Thatcher said famous, famously, there is no alternative, right? So in a way, they were sort of saying that the only option that we have in the 1980s, 1990s, and even later is neoliberalism. So if you do not adopt neoliberalism, Sierra Leone, if you do not adopt neoliberalism, Uh, Paraguay, we won't give you the loans that you need to develop your economy. So let's go over the principles now. You mentioned them earlier. Yeah, uh, I think this is something that uh, your listeners should uh, sort of remember because it's a very easy. It's three letters. D L P. So mm -hmm. first principle of neoliberalism, D, meaning deregulation. So, Makes sense. as I said before, from 1945, roughly until the late 1970s, the state, Keynesianism, controlled capitalism, was regulating economies, which means that economies were free, but they still had to adhere to certain laws, certain regulations. Think, for example, of safety regulations in factories that uh, companies had to adhere to. Deregulation meant that regulations should be taken off the industry so they could use a lot of money that went into those regulations. So if you think of safety laws, again, as an example, right, uh, that's not cheap, right? If you want to guarantee safety, uh, you know, if you want to uh, educate people uh, to be safe at their workplace, all of that costs money. So the idea was if you take away those regulations, Uh, industry, companies, corporations would have more money to put into actual production. They also would be freer to make their own decisions because regulation also meant that the government would tell them, for example, that you have to agree to a 3% uh, wage rate. Mm -hmm. So if you deregulate that, then you could argue that government sort of took itself out of a decision-making process and companies became stronger with regard to the decisions they wanted to make. 
So deregulation is one, it's the first pillar. The second pillar uh, would be L, and L stands for liberalization. Now, liberalization meaning what? Meaning liberalization of trade. So the basic idea behind that was that trade is good for two reasons. It creates a win-win situation. Everybody is better. Uh, you know, you can think of, you know, trading something that you're really very, very good at with something that you like, but not very good at producing. After the successful trade, supposedly, each party is better off. And the other reason why trade is good, their argument is because if countries trade with each other, they are less likely to go to war with each other. Right? Makes sense. That if you're really involved, I mean, think of it just on an individual level. If you have, like, let's, let's say you collect uh, football cards of football players, and you have two or three trading partners, uh, you know, friends that you trust, uh, it's very unlikely, uh, if you really trade with them very intensely, that you're going to sort of uh, fight with them. Or, you know, you may fight with them over price or haggle over price or things like that. But you're not really, quote, are going to go to war with them. You're not going to beat them over the head. Uh, you sort of see them, as I just said before, as friends. Or you try to be friendly because you think you're going to get an advantage out of it. So the idea is that trade actually reduces conflict. So now liberalization of trade means how do we make it possible for trade to become easier and more widespread optimally global trade well the best way is to bring tariffs which are tax taxes that states charge on goods that are being uh, imported bring those tariffs those taxes on goods down again ideally to zero which means that trade is going to be done more easily because it means that goods can flow across national borders more easily because they're not being taxed. So again, the whole idea was let's set up a trade regime that is going to reduce worldwide tariffs so that ideally goods can flow across borders without being taxed, which means that trade volumes are going to go up, which means that parties who are part of those trades are going to benefit third pillar is P. And Margaret Thatcher was really, really into that. P stands for privatization. So what happened between 1945 and 19, 1970s is that a lot of enterprises were owned by the state, meaning by the people. So think, for example, of uh, uh, railway companies. Uh, you know, they tended to be, or steel companies, they tended to be owned by the state. They were so-called state-owned enterprises. So for example, in Austria, where I was born, when I grew up in the 1960s, the largest steel company was owned by the state and operated basically by the state. So people who worked there in the steel company were really state employees because the state was sort of holding the largest chairs or the most chairs. Now, the idea was that if the state should get out of the business of running the economy, then the state should just sell its interest, its shares in these companies, and they should be privatized. In other words, they should be publicly traded. They should become, uh, you know, what is called in Germany, Aktiengesellschaften, right, uh, and uh, stock companies. And that means that the idea behind that was that private interests would now become the owners of all companies, of all corporations, of all industries. And the idea again was that private parties would be more profit oriented because if you own something personally, then you're gonna take care of it more and you're gonna put more labor into it, more effort into it, and that would produce greater profits. So those are the three pillars, DLP. That's the basic program. And then there are a couple of other things that are important. For example, neoliberalism is trying to reduce taxes, especially corporate taxes, again, to make companies more profitable, because the idea is that companies, corporations are the drivers of the economy. And if they do well, or everybody does well, including the workers. The Another little uh, sort of principle of neoliberalism, uh, in addition to that, is that trade unions should be uh, uh, disempowered. In other words, the idea is that if you have strong trade unions, 
then uh, they are going to basically cut into the profit of those corporations because they're going to demand high wages. They're going to demand uh, fringe benefits that are going to be, have to be paid for by the, by the companies. And that's going to cut into the profit. And ultimately, that's going to hurt the economy. So sort of the disempowering of trade companies is also part of it. So you can see here DLP plus tax reduction plus weak unions is sort of gives you the, a basic sense of what uh, the uh, neoliberal program looks like. So that sounds like the main beneficiary of uh, neoliberalism is the corporate world. Exactly. And that's why <laughs> it's not surprising, right, that uh, we very quickly from the 1980s to uh, now uh, created a world in which uh, some of the biggest players, I mean, economic entities are corporations. So think of it, out of the 100 largest, largest economic entities, roughly 50% are states, countries, and 50% are companies. So for example, Apple, the value of Apple is pretty much the same as the GDP of, guess what, Spain. Wow. So we're not talking about a small player, here, right? So we we are seeing that over the last, say, 20, 30, 40 years, corporations have become much, much more powerful as a result of neoliberalism. And the argument is that if corporations become more powerful, again, going back to this original idea of property, then and they're making good profits, that means the shareholders are doing well. And since shareholders are not just individuals, but let's say uh, if you have a private uh, pension, right, you buy a private pension, uh, then a lot of that money is being invested in, uh, uh, you know, companies, in corporations, in, in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, stocks. And that means that your pension is going to go up, too. So everybody benefits. It's the argument. That's a claim. It's an ideological. Maybe the people mainly people who own the most of uh, these uh, stocks and properties, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. One more thing we have to also cover, which I think is going to really interest your uh, uh, listeners, because we are uh, talking about it quite a lot. And it's this magical word outsourcing, which is part of uh, neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is right. It's about maximizing. We just said that maximizing profits of corporations. So one way you can maximize profits is to bring labor costs down. It makes sense, right? The less, if you own a company, the less you have to pay uh, for wages uh, and, and workers, the more profit is going to be left for you. So what is one way of doing that? Well, you know, one way of doing that is that you move your production sites, your factories, from countries that pay high wages mm -hmm. to countries that pay low wages. So jobs get shifted to the global south. So what we saw in the 1990s and 2000s is that a lot of jobs were shifted to places like China, Vietnam, Pakistan, Bangladesh, other low wage countries in the global south, where companies were basically uh, very quickly educating the workforce because a lot of the uh, products that they were making were not high skilled products, uh, but the kind of things that we buy in our supermarkets Uh, and what happened is that the labor costs came down and the companies made more profit. However, jobs that were previously located in the global north, in places like Germany, in places like the United States, were shifting to the global south, which means that the global south, at least for a certain period of time, was doing actually well. Even though the wages were low, it, they were higher than what people were paid before. So they like that. So in India, in China, in Pakistan, most people were quite happy. Uh, they got new jobs that weren't there before. Companies appeared, and all of a sudden, they were doing you know better than they were doing before. However, workers in Germany, workers in France, workers in, in Canada were not too happy because they were losing their jobs, and very often they either couldn't find new jobs or the jobs that they found were paid much less. Hmm. 
So there is this real dilemma. Let's let's sort of let's have our listeners think about that. If you live in a neoliberal world, and to a large extent we're still living in a neoliberal world, would you rather have lower wages? Or would you rather have higher wages but pay more for products? So here we go, right? Lower wages and pay less for stuff that you buy or higher wages and pay more for consumer items. Let's say cars, let's say bicycles, let's say apparel, clothes. So would you rather have higher wages and pay more for the stuff that you need? Or would you rather have lower wages and pay less? And for many decades, at least for three or four decades, the answer was pay less in the supermarket, pay less for a car, pay less for a, a bicycle, even if that means my wage is lower, because if products come down significantly, it's still a good deal. What happened in the last 10 or 15 years, however, is that uh, that sort of equation didn't work anymore. And we can get into uh, a variety of reasons of why it didn't work anymore. But what happened is that basically uh, things got more expensive, inflation kicked up, and now the wages are relatively low and products have become more expensive, which creates a lot of people who are pissed off, people who are dissatisfied with their government, which makes it much more possible for parties like the AFD in Germany uh, or uh, Trump in the United States, right? National populist party that are basically complaining about a lot of things. They are doing much better because we are now in an environment where neoliberalism has created great inequalities and a lot of riches for people in the global South I wouldn't say riches, but at least their incomes have gone up for middle class people and companies are doing well. But ordinary people in the global north, in countries like uh, Canada, United States, Germany, are not doing so well. And that creates dissatisfaction. That creates people who say, oh, I am not satisfied with my government. I want to change. I want to go back to uh, a situation where my life uh, situation is better than it is now. Can you go back over that example with uh, higher wages or uh, low cost products? Um, I don't really understand the difference, especially when it comes to inflation. Wa uh, wage inflation is a thing too. And um, in, in an inflationary scenario, wouldn't the wouldn't the uh, the cost of the products rise? Um, right. Either way, Correct. And that was the problem, right? We had an inflational scenario now for a few years, but we didn't have it like 10 years ago. Inflation was very, very low. So what happened is with neoliberalism, right, as companies relocate their production sites to low wage countries, right? Let's just take China as a concrete example. And let's take Walmart. I don't know if you have Walmart in Germany, but, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's one of the big, big uh, sort of supermarkets where you can buy anything, right? So what happened is as production sites were located to china china was making a lot of t-shirts a lot of glass frames uh, a lot of everything anything you would buy at walmart and because the wages were so low the companies could afford to sell those products corporations at a lower price than previously which was good mm. because it meant that you could afford more things as an average consumer, right? Makes sense. Yep. The problem though was that because jobs shifted to China, maybe your job was on the chopping block as well. So maybe you lost your job to, to a worker in China. You still could buy cheap goods, but you didn't have the well-paying job anymore. As long as the goods stayed low, it was still okay. So, okay, I'm making less money than I made before, but I can still buy stuff. Now, if inflation kicks in, which it did over the last few years, all of a sudden, all these products, all these consumer items go up. Now, it's a different situation. Now you feel you have a really bad end of the bargain because now you have a low paying job and the products have gone up in price too. 
I understand. I understand. Makes sense. So how did that um, impact, uh, let's say, China again, um, their ideology? I mean, in a way, neoliberalism uh, came to then, then, yes. right? Yes. And the Chinese called it socialism with a Chinese face <laughs> or socialism with, a, with Chinese characteristics. You pick your translation. <laughs> Right. Officially, of course, China could never admit that they weren't communist anymore because the Communist Party is a one party rule in China and there are no no competitions. Right. They don't allow at all any political competition, as we know. So they are called the Chinese Communist Party. But in reality, they are just sort of a authoritarian government that is open to what? To neoliberalism. Hmm. Some of the richest people in China are party people. Some of the biggest entrepreneurs are members of the Communist Party. So what happened is that China was welcoming all those Western corporations relocating their production sites to China because it meant that the masses of Chinese people had jobs. It meant that China itself became a place where business was being conducted, where products were being, uh, uh, you know, produced. And that meant it was good for the Chinese economy. So over 20 years, the Chinese economy was growing like crazy. So what But do you do, right? You can't call yourself capitalist because you're officially communist. You're acting like a capitalist. So you just call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. But isn't there isn't that the argument of, uh, like you said earlier, of neoliberalists um, that in the end, um, the uh, the people also benefit from this ideology? And isn't that what happened in a way in China then? Yeah, it happened in terms of, you know, people's uh, uh, personal uh, life situation, you know, their living standards certainly went up for the middle class. There's no question about that. Same in India. So they benefited from this sort of globalization of neoliberalism. Yes. But hmm. as you can imagine, there is a certain uh, expiration date to this. Because as you are a low labor country and you're doing better and your people are doing better, prices will go up and wages will go up in your country too, right? So what is neoliberalism going to do? It's going to jump from China, where all of a sudden the wage level have risen as a result of their doing really well, to another country where it's still pretty low. Let's go to Bangladesh. Let's go to Pakistan, right? So, so yes, what happens to the for a certain time, but it doesn't work forever. What what happens to the countries then who um, adopted neoliberalism but now face these problems? Is is there a new ideology uh, that, that they then uh, turn to? They must, because if the ideology doesn't match the realities on the ground, people aren't stupid, right? Uh, they're going to be up, uh, very upset and unhappy. So that's exactly what's happening right now, Timon, in, in China. That uh, I think you heard that their growth is slowing. China, you know, Chinese economic growth is slowing. You probably also heard that there are real, real issues with regard to Uh, their construction initiatives. You know, they had this big construction initiative that was called One Road, One Belt, or One Belt, One Road, depending on how you translate it, which was this idea that China was putting a lot of money into the construction of uh, roads, a construction of infrastructure, uh, housing, and so on and so forth. And they did accept that as wages go up and corporations move away from China, People lose their job. Who can afford those apartments anymore? Right. So a lot of what they built in terms of this infrastructure, a lot of buildings simply are too expensive now for Chinese to move into, which means this is going to slow down the economy, which means that China is facing in a way uh, what uh, you always get uh, at the end of an evening where you had too many beers. I just got a headache. So they're now experiencing that hangover, that headache. And you're right. The first thing that you say probably when you have a hangover is, oh, my God, I'm never going to have a beer again. Right. So maybe just maybe they are now rethinking their strategy of sort of adopting this neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism. And who knows? You know, what we've seen is now a leader in China, Xi Jinping, who is becoming very authoritarian. 
all of a sudden there are no more rotations among presidents, which China did for the last 20 years. He wants to be a new Mao. He doesn't want to step down from his position as president. So maybe that's already an indication for us that China is becoming perhaps more authoritarian, less capitalist, uh, who knows? And in Western states? Western states, I think we're seeing the same thing, right? We're seeing, uh, in a way, neoliberalism is not delivering anymore. You could argue that in the 1980s, 1990s, you know, neoliberalism was uh, delivering uh, cheap products. Neoliberalism was delivering tax cuts for people. Neoliberalism was, uh, you know, especially in the 1990s, I remember, and in the early 2000s, seemed to be a pretty good deal. But that's not anymore the case. And what's really interesting is that the reason why it's not working anymore, again, we already went through that, right, has to do with the fact that uh, it has an expiration date. You can only sort of hand over the control of the economy to corporations for a certain period of time until the inequality that exists if profits go to corporations and not to the masses of people becomes so big that you have what's called a social problem, the social problem of inequality. And that's what we're experiencing. I have read a quote, and I wrote it down here, uh, from Noam Chomsky. I um, would assume you probably know him. Um, yeah. Neoliberalism is destroying our democracy. Can you touch upon that? Well, neoliberalism is destroying the democracy. I'm not sure if it's destroying the democracy, uh, but uh, it's certainly challenging democracy. I would, I would st uh, agree with Chomsky in, 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 insofar as it challenges democracy. It challenges democracy in two ways. The first way is it shifts power from elected government, state, to corporations that are not elected. And we all know that democracy is based on the idea that people decide who is running uh, society, who is making laws, who is enforcing those laws, who is making sure that people are well off, right? All of those things supposedly are part of government decisions. And that's why we go and elect people. And if they're free elections, we have a democracy. Now, if government gets puts itself, takes itself out of the economy, which is a huge, important segment of decision making, it means that the economy is becoming less and less democratic, less and less, remember, regulated, deregulation. And that means power is becoming more and more accountable, unaccountable, more and more in private hands. And that's not democratic. The second Isn't thing, it? Oh, sorry. In, yep. Sorry. The second thing in which neoliberalism is challenging democracy is that if inequality increases as a result of neoliberalism, meaning that those people on top, the 1% are doing well, the 99% are not doing so well. If that's true, you then get within the 99% people who are resentful, people who think their society is not working well people who think that they're worse off than they used to be, people who think that uh, government is just uh, basically a, a loaded game that just benefits the rich. And when people are in that angry state, they turn, tend to turn to people who promise them a lot of things, people who scapegoating other people, like immigrants, like uh, uh, people of other ethnic uh, backgrounds, like uh, women, or people who, uh, you know, are uh, somehow marginalized. In other words, they are sort of thriving on discontent. And if neoliberalism creates discontent, then it is likely that more and more people will turn to people who promise them easy solutions, and again, sort of authoritarian types of people. This is precisely what happened in Germany in the 1930s, as we know, and the outcome was, was Hitler, right? Uh, it was a major economic crisis. Uh, people were dissatisfied. They were willing to take the chances on somebody who was really, really sounded very extreme, but they have, had lost uh, confidence in normal government. So I'm afraid that what Chomsky is talking about is if people lose confidence in democratic government, then 
we might see the rise of authoritarianism and then the end of democracy. Uh, to the first point I wanted to add or ask, um, that is when when we're deciding uh, whom we buy products off, isn't that a, in a way democratic as well? It is. It is democratic insofar as the consumer makes a choice. But it's not a choice that is made on a blank canvas. We are only choosing among things that are produced. And they are produced at a certain place. So in other words, if we had a perfectly democratic supermarket, a perfectly democratic Walmart, we should have products that are produced in, and sometimes you hear free trade or instead of free trade, just trade, fair trade, products that were produced under circumstances that give workers more wage, that don't let all the profits flow to corporations, they should be in supermarkets too. But most of the products that you find in supermarkets are products that are produced by the big corporations in countries that have low labor uh, levels. So in a way, yes, you make a choice but you make a choice among products that have already been pre-selected for you. Hmm. So it's not okay. a real choice in that sense. I understand. Um, is there any way to measure neoliberalism? Like, is there an indice of, um, yeah. or an index of worldwide yeah, neoliberalism or s something like that? Well, there are a lot of, there are so-called globalization indexes. And those indexes are, are really, really uh, helpful. Uh, your viewers may, uh, you know, look them up. Uh, the, uh, there's the ETH index uh, that comes out of Zurich uh, in Switzerland. Uh, that's a global a globalization institute that measures uh, uh, global trade, particularly economic flows of goods and services and labor uh, across borders. Uh, there's also, I think, a very uh, helpful way of measuring it uh, through Uh, even uh, uh, companies, capitalist companies that specialize in measuring uh, trade flows or, or flows of goods and services, like, uh, for example, McKinsey, M-C-K-I-N-S-E-Y, that's a management company. And if you look it up on Google, what you will find is the issuing reports on, uh, you know, how the world economy is going. And on the basis of their data, you can sort of see to what extent uh, is neoliberalism doing well or not well, or to what extent is the world economy still neoliberal? Because what we've seen in uh, recent years is that this idea of free trade has been challenged. Think of the trade wars between Trump and China uh, during the Trump presidency, for example. And internationally, what, are the uh, what is the trend uh, to a more neoliberalistic uh, world? It's or mixed. It's really it's mixed. mixed. So, you know, neoliberalism uh, is still very strong in terms of, for example, one idea of neoliberalism we haven't touched upon yet is, and I think that's a pretty straightforward one, is this notion or this claim that governments should be efficient, they should be lean, there shouldn't be any big budget deficits, government should be run like corporations. Hmm. So that idea is still very strong. And if government should be run like corporations, it means that taxes should be low because government shouldn't spend too much, right? So that idea of lean, efficient government, governments that don't spend too much, that neoliberal idea of governance, you could call it, is still very strong. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, privatization, I think, is still pretty strong. The notion that most large companies uh, should not be run by the state because the state is running them inefficiently is still very strong. Trade, I think, is different. I think increasingly there is the idea that uh, trade is going to produce not winners and winners, both sides win, but one side wins and one loses. And if mm. that's the case, then we have to protect ourselves from the winners of the trade. So what happened is that a lot of uh, populist politicians, again, uh, politicians like Le Pen in France or, uh, or Trump in the United States, were saying that China was the big winner. So therefore, 
we should protect ourselves from uh, China uh, basically getting all those, uh, 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 having all those corporations move to China and China being part of the global trade regime and be a beneficiary of no tariffs. Uh, you know, we have to put tariffs on Chinese goods. And you can see already that that's an idea that's very, very foreign to neoliberalism and seen as very dangerous because it means that, uh, you know, we are sort of walling, countries are walling themselves off. And if they don't trade with each other anymore, right, then the idea is that conflict will, the likelihood of conflict will be greater. And that's precisely what we've seen. You know, we see a lot of conflict in the world now. We see the Ukraine war, we see the war in Israel, we see... Uh, conflicts, uh, you know, around the world and, and conflicts that may not be full fledged wars. But look at the South uh, China Sea, right? Sort of China posturing, taking over Hong Kong is threatening Taiwan is threatening the Philippines, right? We have a, a world where conflict has really gone up recently. And the argument that neoliberals would make is, yeah, it has gone up because this idea of free trade uh, has unfortunately been reversed to some extent and uh, tariffs have been introduced and that means uh, we're going to get a more dangerous world. What I was wondering as well is um, since you did a lot of research on neoliberalism, what is your conclusion, your personal conclusion? What is um, your opinion on neoliberalism? Do you think in the end it's a good thing, if one can say that, or um, not so good, or what? what is your opinion on the topic? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question, Timo, because I think a lot of uh, listeners are asking that question too, and it's an important question to ask. And I think it is really crucial for everybody to understand that big questions like the one that you just answered are not black and white. It's really important, because I think in the mind of a lot of our listeners, there's still sort of this mathematics, right? When we do math in school uh, uh, and we do our equations, then X equals something like five or four or three. In other words, there's one concrete answer and that's it. It's black and white. It's either right or it's wrong. In math, you can't be half right and half wrong. In the social world, the world that we live in, there is no black and white in terms of 100% right and 100% wrong. So my answer, and this is not a cop out, is that my honest attitude about neoliberalism is that it's mixed. And I give you three sort of reasons why I think that and three examples. What I think is good about neoliberalism, without a doubt, is sort of the idea that every person should have a right to property, and they should be able to individually better their situation. And they should not be controlled by states to the point where they feel that they cannot reach the life goals that they have in mind. So I think this idea of neoliberalism, of individual freedoms, and property is just one of them, which you pointed out, but that we have individual freedoms and that government should be limited, I think, is a good idea. It shouldn't be abolished altogether. Obviously, we need government, but government should not be overpowering. I think that is a really good thing about neoliberalism. I think what is bad about neoliberalism, and we've seen that, is, and I said this before, it generates inequalities. In other words, if neoliberalism gives this gigantic boost, and we just talked about deregulation, liberalization, privatization, low corporate taxes, uh, low, uh, weak labor unions, if it gives, gives this tremendous boost to private industry, it means that they make huge profits, but those profits, as we all know, go to the CEOs, they go to the large shareholders, and ordinary people, workers, are experiencing stagnating wages. We've seen that under neoliberalism. So you could say that, yeah, the 1% are really doing well, but the rest of us, most of us, are not doing so well, certainly not in the long run. So what is bad about neoliberalism is that there is too much of a uh, distribution, you could say, of profits towards the top. 
And that's where we need the state. That's where we need democratic governments to say that, okay, we don't want to take away people's individual rights, but we're going to make sure that part of those profits in terms of taxes are going to be distributed to people who are not as well off. And neoliberalism doesn't want to do that. And I think mm. that's a problem. So inequality is not good. And then a third thing about neoliberalism that uh, I think is also really problematic is that it creates inequality not just within countries, but also across countries. So it tends to create places, uh, and we call it very often the global north or the northern hemisphere or the rich countries, that are really, really doing well because most large corporations are headquartered, uh, as you can imagine, in places like uh, the EU and the United States and Australia and so on. And the global south, large parts of Africa, large parts of Latin America, large parts of Asia, especially Southeast Asia, are actually stagnating. They are not doing well. And it uh, perpetuates that inequality not just within countries, but across countries. The only countries that we've seen that sort of benefited for a while from neoliberalism, again, China, uh, you know, uh, you could say Vietnam possibly. So we're talking about sort of East Asian countries, Taiwan, you know, that have been doing uh, okay. But even there, as we said, the situation is now changing because their wage levels have gone up. And big capital is moving now to places that are uh, even cheaper than they used to be. So inequality is the bad thing about neoliberalism. The good thing about neoliberalism is sort of an emphasis on, on rights and property and, and individual achievement that I think is something that pe most people think uh, they should have. So how would you fix neoliberalism? I think the way to fix neoliberalism is to get uh, democratic government uh, back into the equation more, meaning that we, if neoliberalism was talking about deregulation, we have to think about smart re-regulation. In other words, industry has to be regulated again. There have to be some tax increases for corporations because they've been doing really well. I'm sure you read uh, uh, lots of companies are making record profits, have been making record profits. So, uh, you know, there has to be some way in which government is saying, OK, you guys are going to have to share some of your profits with uh, people who helped you produce those profits. So re-regulation is one of the things that I would, would uh, be in favor of. And I think the other thing that uh, would be very, very important is uh, sort of education, critical education, insofar as education has become very, very expensive. Now think of it, neoliberalism is saying everything should be, remember, privatized. Now this is also true for education. So universities, for example, I know in Germany the situation is still okay, but it's changing there as well. Uh, in, in some EU countries like, as you know, Holland and the UK, already charging a pretty high tuition. There's more and more privatization. There are now even private universities in Germany and Austria that weren't there before 20, 25 years ago, right? It is becoming more and more expensive for people to get an education. And I think that part of ways in which neoliberalism can be fixed is to, again, make sure that some of the profits are being redistributed to education to make education as widely acceptable and available as possible and uh, you know as cheap as possible because without a critical without an educated citizenry we are in danger going back to the chomsky quote you were giving me we are in danger of producing citizens who are not going to be able anymore to see the dangers to democracy i mean the whole point of education is to create a critical citizenry so part of the fixing process has to be to make education, you know, widely available. And here in the United States, one of the programs that excited young people the most was when Bernie Sanders, the, sen the senator from Vermont, who was sort of a, uh, you know, left-wing firebrand, was talking about forgiveness, loan forgiveness for students. So he was arguing that uh, students become so indebted while they're studying 
because they have to pay for it, for tuition and housing and all of that, that by the time that they get their degrees, they're a hundred thousand, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars in debt. So that's a huge burden to start your professional life with. So his argument was let's raise taxes and make sure that those loans are forgiven. And that of course, as you can imagine, uh, created a very strong sympathetic wave among students. However, industry was, and banks especially, right, who live off the interest of student loans were of course dead set against it, right? Makes sense. Uh, even though, isn't there an argument to be made um, that in regards now, for example, education, um, the even even though um, the people might benefit less from neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalism in that way, um, they might benefit from better products and uh, newer products, which maybe have more features. Uh, features, because for example, now I can instead of maybe going to a university if I don't have the money for it, um, be on Google and on YouTube and learn there, which wasn't possible before. Yeah, I mean, you, you can say that the tech, the digital uh, technology, you know, has created, uh, you know, a, a different situation. But, you know, you don't want to push that too far because even uh, online education, I don't know about Europe, but online education is not for free. Uh, and in other words, even if you don't go to a regular university, but you sort of educate yourself, you know, online, there are a lot of webinars and things like that that are not free. Uh, and And secondly, you know, if you want to, bet your money on that digital horse, be careful because it may buck and throw you off. And the bucking and throwing you off may come in the form of generative AI. So artificial intelligence and automation are also products that come out of that digital framework, meaning that they may actually eat up jobs. You know, the more we push into the digital world, maybe the less you need people, uh, you know, actual physical people who are going to work. And that's why a number of people came up with this idea of, uh, well, why don't we have a guaranteed basic income or universal basic income that we pay citizens regardless of whether they work or not, let's say a thousand euros a month. And then, you know, it's no longer such a, a big pressure on them to get a full-time job. Maybe they can just get by with a part-time job, which means that you can then negotiate automation and artificial intelligence and, and, and job a digitalization more easily. So there are all kinds of ideas around that as well. But again, you know, it's something that is not a, a technology is not going to rescue us. Technology uh, may be helpful in many ways, but it also opens up a whole can of worms. Um, before we go over to our second segment, uh, which is some rapid fire questions, um, I would like to ask you is there anything that i should have asked that i didn't or anything else you want to add uh you asked very very good questions so you know i really i really enjoyed you know answering them perhaps one one question that i can think of uh is uh is neoliberalism uh, something that might sort of work together with authoritarianism You see, previously in our discussion, we've talked about China adopting capitalism and becoming more authoritarian. <clears throat> and in other words, is it possible that neoliberalism, that we can have a society where you can own property and where you can be economically active, but politically you have to shut up, if you get my drift? I do. And I think that that's a scary kind of combination. That is not out of the question. If you think of some of the uh, fascist regimes in the past, right, uh, whether it's Italy or, or Germany or Chile uh, in the 1970s, they were all economically pretty open. You could own property in Germany, you know, under Hitler, but politically you were, you know, totally, totally dominated, right? So the idea that neoliberalism is challenging democracy, we're going back to that, that Chomsky quote, is something that I think uh, is something to be considered. So it's really, really important to sort of see rights, individual rights, not just as economic rights, or not primarily as economic rights as neoliberals do, but see rights also as civil rights, as political rights, 
as all kinds of other rights. Thank you. That was, that was good. That was a good um, to add that. Um, I will go over to the rapid fire questions. Um, please answer in round about two to three sentences so okay. that they are really rapid fire. Um, and I will start if you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, note some of these are um, not necessarily linked to uh, neoliberalism, um, but to your own personal opinions. Right. Um, if you had a big poster, let's say on Times Square, everybody yeah. would see it, what would you yeah. put on it? I would put on it, uh, if we don't change things fundamentally, we are going to be on an evolutionary dead end. Do you have a favorite quote? Uh, one of my favorite quotes, which is, a, I give you a pessimistic one and an optimistic one. One of my favorite pessimistic quotes is from Georg Friedrich Hegel, the great German philosopher. And he says, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> That's the pessimistic one. Uh, the optimistic one is uh, a quote that uh, is ascribed to an American uh, baseball player. It's also very funny. Uh, who said, when you get to the f to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> okay. Um, a controversial opinion, I believe what almost nobody else does. And a, a controversial opinion? Uh, we don't need iPhones. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> 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 um, what would you have liked to know when you were 20? Uh, I would have liked uh, the all the winners of the FIFA World Cup to all the way to 2022. <laughs> Sports betting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's your newest biggest inside? Uh, my what? Sorry, newest the, biggest oh, insight newest biggest insight that's a great question uh i think it is that your body really changes after you hit 60. Hmm. Hmm. that's a big insight because i'm 62 so i can i can attest to the fact that that's true um, how would you spend $10 billion to make the world a better place? I would create a foundation that would be dedicated to some of the biggest global issues and problems, including climate change, including uh, sustainable food production, including education. What do you think of Noam Chomsky? Noam Chomsky, I think that he is... Uh, brilliant linguist, uh, a good political thinker, and a mediocre politician or policymaker. If you do know her, what do you think of Naomi Klein? Naomi Klein, yes, uh, I know her. Uh, I think she's a jack of all trades. She is a very good writer, but she is dabbling into too many issues that she's not necessarily very well informed about. What do you think of John Maynard Keynes? Uh, I think again that he is probably the most important economist of the 20th century. And I think that his ideas, even though they have to be revised according to the 21st century, are still very, very good guidelines of how we can, as you put it, sort of uh, fix neoliberalism. And what do you think of Milton Friedman? I think Milton Friedman uh, is a extremist who did more harm than good in his theories. Well, 
Manfred, thank you very much. Um, if you want to know more about uh, his ideas uh, on neoliberalism and insights, um, check out his book, Neoliberalism, a very short introduction by the Oxford University Press. And if there's anything else you want to promote, maybe in social media or um, your website or anything, um, please do so. Yes, by all means, just Google me, Manfred Steger, uh, Amazon, uh author's website uh you'll find plenty of things thank you for being here thank you perfect